Hi, I'm uh, Dylan Hardison. I, uh, I'm going to talk to you about some work I did make, making 20-year-old code run on Modulicious, which uh, was a little bit interesting. Uh, I think there's some background information about Bugzilla that if I don't tell you, then some of the reasons for certain things might not make any sense. So I want to explain that there's a distinction between Bugzilla, which is an open source project that you're probably familiar with, and then the thing that I'm actually responsible for my day job, which is bugzilla.mozilla.org, which is a fork of that, like a fork by the same people. But uh, basically, bugzilla.mozilla.org is uh, made by Mozilla employees for the development of Firefox, and uh, it's, it's quite a bit different. So BMO is a lot bigger. Uh, the code size is, uh, I think, dub not double, but uh, you, can, you can see lines. It's 155,000 lines of Perl, 24,000 lines of JavaScript, uh, 72,000 lines of templates, and in comparison to but a vanilla Bugzilla, that's quite a bit larger. Also, the spread of distribution of code is shown there. You can see that we actually have most code in modules, which is decent. Uh, the other thing that's really different is we have a lot of real users. I mean, actually, there's other Bugzilla installs that have a lot of users, like Red Hats. But uh, in particular, I know how many users we have, unless, except for the ones that are using Do Not Track. So of people that don't use tracking protection, we have about 228,000 uh, active users over a period of about a month. So a lot of users care about it, apparently. And uh, we have better UX. So if you've ever used like a vanilla upstream Bugzilla, it looks pretty bad. Uh, lately, we've had a UX effort, and things tend to look a little bit better. We actually have a person, uh, Bugzilla UX, all, uh, whose name is Kohei, and he's been doing amazing stuff with front end. And uh, pretty happy with that. But uh, so there's this nice thing that's called Bugzilla, and there's this other nice thing that's also called Bugzilla, but the, the one that I work on uh, hopefully will be the new upstream. There's this project we have called Harmony, which is basically taking bugzilla.mozilla.org and making it what the upstream is. So basically rebasing it on our fork. Uh, our self fork, I guess, is the right way of saying that. So anyway, um, I'm going to be taught everything I'm talking about now has to do with the, the bugzilla.mozilla.org, but it's still usable by anyone else uh, soon. All right, uh, oh, and all the code is available, whoops. All the code is available on GitHub, so I mean, it's still open source, it's just a different branch. Uh, communities are complicated things, and sometimes you have to you know, fork things. So why Mojo? Well, uh, I think that it can be explained with one word, uh, or maybe two words with an underscore, but an underscore is a word character, so it's really one word. But uh, uh, so we require a system Perl if you use Mod Perl, or you can do some weird things like building Apache. It has lots of weird bugs, including there's a buffer. Sometimes if you're doing weird things with HTTP and you're using an older version of Apache, you can get stuff that stays on a buffer, and then weird things happen, like you accidentally responding 200 to something that should be a 500 error, and uh, it's not fun. Uh, and there's not a lot of support if something's broken in Mod and mod, something is broken with mod Perl and you want it fixed, or something's broken in Perl and you need help fixing it, there's not a lot of people that can help you with that, so everything is pain. Uh, so bugs, speaking of bugs, just really quickly, I originally was going to use Modulicious inside uh, Apache because it was just for a small project that was going to fix some things, but I ran into some interesting issues, like if you delete env mod Perl on, uh, in the mod Perl environment, you can never get it back. It like you can't set the key. Even if you set it to one, it's gone. If you localize the, sorry, if you localize the um, hash and delete it, it's also still gone. The reason for that is some XS code here that's in the older versions of Mod Perl. They're doing something slightly better now, but what they're doing in the version I was running was copying the magic structure uh, off of the env hash, and that, yeah, that's what's going on. So you can fix this, and I actually considered fixing this. I wrote some XS code to fix this uh, to basically be able to delete the that magic thing. You could do this, uh, and then I saw, you know, I'm writing XS code to fix this problem so I can use a Modulicious in one thing. Why don't I just replace Mod Pro with Modulicious? And uh, so that's the background, and that's where we're going to be. How difficult could it, could it be to replace Mod Pro with Modulicious? Not hard, right? So let's do it. Uh, a note, there's a Modulicious CGI plugin, which I looked at using, but it runs things as processes. It basically emulates CGI very well, but we haven't been running in CGI for more than 15 years. We've been running in Mod Perl, so what I need to do is pretend to be that and not not a true CGI with a separate process and everything. So limited scope. I don't need to support anything other than my application. I I really don't want the CGI code to live much longer. I just want a path forward to be able to use Mojo stuff. 
So I can limit the scope, and uh, most everything, most every page generation thing looks exactly like this. We have, I get a CGI object that has input, we print out some headers, we process a template. Pretty much everything works like that, except like every time you update a bug, there's this list of stuff that actually, whoops, that's kind of hard to read with contrast, but every time we update a bug, you get a list of uh, emails that have been sent, and that's generated inside the model layer because my because life is pain. Um, but it's okay. The, the, we, can, we, we can fix this. There's two parts that we need to fix. There's input and output. So input is the CGI object. Uh, that's not the normal CGI object. We, we subclass the CGI object. We also subclass DVI. Uh, and we also subclass template toolkit. Like literally everything that Bugzilla used in the past, they subclassed it. It's pretty fun. But anyway, uh, so for input, we really just need to fake ENV. And we can fake ENV using this code that I lifted from the CGI plugin for the most part. Uh, there's two bits of here that uh, are important. There's the headers that come from the request, and there's the query parameters, uh, and there's some other stuff there. But so to get the headers, we that's really simple. Um, also, to get the query parameters, here's a little bit of tie-in with Mojo. I can t capture uh, get Mojo's captures from the routes and just pretend they're query parameters, which means instead of uh, having slash showbug.cgi uh, question mark ID equals 900, you can just have bug slash 900 and do a normal Mojo route. So already I get a slight benefit from using Mojo. I get the same, same routes. Now they're standard in. Uh, you need to fake standard in. I also just kind of copied the code that the plugin's using. It's writing on a file, and I was actually concerned about the performance of this, but Linux is really cool. So when I write out a little file and it's about below a certain size, and then I read it in from the same process, it seems like it never actually hits the disk, or it doesn't, doesn't always have to hit the disk. So not really inefficient. All right, so that's input. So I have a request comes in, and I fake a CGI environment to do that, and now I need to do output. So output is actually very interesting. Do you see this line here where it says print CGI header? So for the last 15 years, that print has done absolutely nothing. That print does nothing at all. Because in running under Mod Pro, when you call CGI header, it actually just sets the headers using Apache methods. Uh, so I can do that too. Um, and this is the code that does that. This is in our, we have like a very long list of things that we do to headers. So I'm still using all of the stuff that we already do to headers in the old code. But then I just have Mojo parse it and then set it on the response object, and everything is OK. Uh, now we need output. Originally, I thought I could just take template process and have that sort of become the render method until I realized that sometimes we process multiple templates to make the same result, which, like I said, life is sometimes pain. But that's OK, so we can just tie sta uh, standard out. And uh, so it can tie standard out, initial naive version, because obviously the only thing we'll be printing out through standard out is bytes, right? No, there's actually character encodings. So the, uh, the character encoding of choice is this, which I know is wrong, but it exists in approximately 87 places in the code, and I didn't have time to fix that now. I'm going to fix that, by the way, not use the UTF-8 layer. Instead, use the big UTF-8 validating layer. But for the moment, that's what we do. So when we do that, we fake bin mode on our tied object, and we just set the encoding. Notice that I'm only supporting what we have, so we either have bin mode with no argument, uh, or sorry, with a mode of bytes or raw, and in that case, there's no encoding, and then otherwise, there's a UTF-8 encoding, and then print ends up being like that. So we get our nice bytes and send it to Mojo, and meanwhile, we have output record separator because we actually relied on new lines going out in some cases. Uh, don't ask. <laughs> meanwhile, we call exit a fair bit of times to end requests early, so we actually need to emulate exit. This was real fun to debug, by the way, because the behavior was just that the single process Mojo server stops, and you don't get a response or anything. It's just gone. Um, but that's OK, because we can just capture exit and throw an exception. So in summary, uh, we use CGI header to uh, manipulate the Mojo-licious response object. We print to standard out to emulate, uh, to call to, uh, to the context right uh, method, and then we trap exit. And with that, every single CGI can pretty much be uh, emulated and run in Mojo. Uh, we have actually tests. We have uh, three test suites. We have unit tests. We have web service tests. And we have uh, Selenium tests that run against the thing. Uh, as of for a month or two now, all of those tests have been passing. And uh, we're going to be deploying this very soon. Like, it would be deployed now, except I'm here, and it would be really bad to deploy things while the lead developer is off speaking at a conference. So 
when I get back, we're going to run it. We're going to run it alongside the Apache one and very uh, carefully uh, roll it in uh, to make sure there's no errors at edge cases that haven't been caught by testing or manual testing or so on. But the whole reason for this is because we wanted to get some, some superpowers from Mojo. And the, the basic things that we want, the three big things, is plugins. So the original reason for doing this is we wanted an OAuth 2 identity provider uh, code. And the nicest way of doing that seemed to be the Mojo plugin. So ideally, this is all of this work exists to get, to get off. But really, there's other stuff we want. The, so, the UX person would really like server sent events so that uh, things can be updated without the page refreshing like you, know, you would want to do. And also, there's things we have planned for doing with WebSockets. And then hooks around requests is actually ends up being remarkably important to security. As I mentioned, we have a lot of logic around headers that we send out. There are a large number of headers that are really important to set on responses. Uh, among those are content security policy. One of the things we haven't been able to do easily with Apache is set a content security policy on all static requests, so all things that are like random files that don't allow, you, don't allow them to do anything fun. So you can have a content security policy request that says, this can't execute any JavaScript. It's also really good to set that on APIs, by the way, because if you have an API that can ever return anything that a browser can interpret as HTML, then you potentially have a weird cross-site scripting vulnerability. So security uh, has had us had an open request for years for us to be able to add these, you know, diff these headers, content security policy, and other things to requests that were not originally generated by Perl in the old Mod Perl application. So that's one big thing, or three big things. There's other stuff. Uh, currently, uh, we are using the Schwartz. Uh, so of my counterpart over at Red Hat for a while had co-maint or maint on on the Schwartz. Uh, he works on Red Hat's Bugzilla, and uh, he, I think, fled from having to do that, and so I'm not sure who the maintainer is now. But uh, So we rely on the Schwartz to send email, and it's really quite crufty. It would be, uh, we have an abstraction around that too, by the way. We uh, subclassed, the, well, that was normal. But because we have an abstraction around the Schwartz, it should be pretty easy to replace it with Minion, which is a thing that I would really like to do. And then finally, uh, there's like a bunch of other things. In, in particular for this, the, uh, the fact that there's a request ID fulfills another requirement that we got from ops to be able to identify a request as it comes in through the load balancer to the application and then into the logs. Like being able to do that is, is an outstanding request. Uh, other things that we are really excited to do is uh, our session cookies can now be signed. Um, and of course, we can use JWTs for a few things. We're actually going to be using JWTs for uh, an identifier for the, from the user so that we can block abusive users at the load balancer level. Because an amazing thing that people want to do is that we have 1.4, 1 almost 1.5 million bugs, and there's researchers that want this. And so what they do is they write a Java program that goes and requests like 100 bugs at a time or 1,000 bugs at a time or... A lot, of, a lot of bugs at a time, and that puts a lot of load. And that's fine, we'll scale up, but we don't like scaling up and costing extra money for nothing. And usually when you're, if you're, someone's thinking of doing this, uh, for bugs there's 1.4 million, for comments there's 20 million. And to even do this even at a fairly high rate would take a really long time. And so we want to block those people, and there are now, we now have better tooling to be able to block those. So uh, I would also like to point out that Bugzilla is 20 years old as of like 11 days ago. And uh, as, as my colleague Bugzilla UX, who's Kohei, says, um, it's deadly outdated. And I think that's a fair assessment. But the Mojo stuff gives us, or at least gives me, hope that we can do nice things with it. And uh, it's, it's already helped development because it's much easier to run um, Morbo in your current directory than it is to like set up Apache and or set up a Docker VM or set up Vagrant. Uh, so I have exactly five minutes for any questions. I would suspect there would be some, especially about my sanity for emulating CGI in this way. But I assure you that I'm doing nearly the exact same thing that Mod Perl is doing, and actually that's never a statement that you should say. But. <laughs> Question?
What's the reaction from the Bugzilla current users been to changing the back end? No one cares. Oh, what do you mean current users? Do you mean end users or do you mean us, um, like other installs? Um, answer both ways, I guess. Okay. Uh, so the uh, answer from the say from Red Hat, which I communicate with a fair bit, uh, their developers are not entirely enthusiastic about Modulicious, but they have a little bit of enthusiasm because I have promised them that I can remove other dependencies by adding Mojo. They're very sensitive to dependencies because they have to package everything as RPMs to deploy it. Uh, we don't have that requirement at Mozilla. We just use Carton. But um, yeah, so that's been good. A end users don't notice. Like Ideally, they don't notice at all. Maybe they notice that uh, they can start having nicer user experiences using server sent events. But end users don't care. Other sites probably, I probably can sell almost everyone on fewer dependencies because of Mojo. Uh, adding new dependencies is always uh, politically difficult for Bugzilla, which is why historically the upstream product kind of languished because uh, of a f inability to use extensions. Any more questions? Yeah. Hi, so uh, great talk. Um, do you use Mojo tests for, for your test suite, or is that something else? Currently, the tests are run, uh, they predate the Mojo migration, and they run using a full uh, uh, container that's running the application uh, in CircleCI. I, I have a question, actually. Sure. Um, uh, with those changes you're working on now, mm. um, what does it the future look like when it comes to saying new features and stuff? Oh, a good, good question. Actually, so that's the other thing. We need APIs for all of the UX work that my colleague is planning on doing. And when I say colleague, I actually mean this person is a, currently a volunteer that's just doing this because they want to make the UX better. Um, adding new APIs is the one, number one blocker for doing UX stuff. And the ad, all new APIs, all new REST endpoints to communicate with them, or actually probably GraphQL, for talking to the bug database and manipulating things. All of that uh, will be in Mojo. And so older API, I have a philosophy that APIs don't die, they just get deprecated. And if no one is ever using them, then maybe they can go away. So the old APIs will probably remain in the CGI emulation layer until no one's using them, but like all new stuff will be using uh, Mojo. As for uh, another question, we're currently tying into our existing template system, and so there's no no real chance of changing that for a while, unless the, and that is pretty much driven by UX because the UX person has already got familiar with the existing templates. Uh, and we've, I'm actually doing several uh, optimizations to the template toolkit that aren't standard, uh, which would be another talk. Uh, I compile template toolkit differently than it's normally compiled. Any more questions? I think we can say thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.